thanks everybody for uh tuning in this morning uh my name is wab gijik rice i'm a member of the bear clan of the nishnabe of wasoxing and wasoxing is on georgian bay near perry sound ontario and right now i live in sudbury ontario this is the traditional territory of the tikamikshing nishnabe under the robinson huron treaty and i'm um, coming in uh, at you from my couch in my living room and my wife and two sons are uh, downstairs uh, watching TV. Um, it's a great delight to be here. Uh, Chmiigwech, thank you very much Maxine and Marwan for inviting me to join you this month. And big thanks to the whole Creative Mornings Ottawa team. Um, I know we have a global audience this morning and I'm delighted to speak with you all, but I'm especially delighted to connect with the Ottawa community. Uh, my wife and I uh, met there. I lived there for seven years where I worked primarily as a journalist. Our first son was born there. So Ottawa will always hold a special place in my heart. And I just want to, again, extend my thanks to, to all of you for uh, logging in this morning. So um, I know we have a lot to get to, and I know I want to make sure that I leave some time for your questions. So I will uh, just get to what I wanted to share with you all this morning. And uh, I was really intrigued by the theme of radical when uh, Maxine and Marwan first uh, approached me. And uh, for me, um, I guess that has been uh, really a constant idea in my life, um, even since before I was born. And I've really been able to witness throughout my 41 years uh, on this earth, um, how radical moments in, on the, in the family level, on the personal level and at the grassroots community level can really lead to social change. And um, for me, it's uh, been about pushing back against the status quo, you know, by um, sort of embodying radical ideas, but also considering how those ideas should be the status quo at the same time. And a few things I want to leave you to think about at the end of our talk today are just sort of rethinking your place on the land, um, reconsidering what Canadian history is, and maybe some of the actions and activities you can take on a personal level within your community to help uh, promote and sort of perpetuate radical change uh, within your own life and for the benefit of your own community. Um, so I think for me, uh, being radical started before I was born. And my dad is from Wasoxing First Nation, he's Anishinaabe. And my mom is from Perry Sound, Ontario, by way of Kaposkasing, Ontario, and she is a white Canadian of settler descent. So they met when they were in high school back in the early 1970s, and uh, they decided that they wanted to get together and get married. And it was not necessarily radical at the time for, I guess, a mixed relationship like that, but it wasn't as common as it is today. Um, despite that maybe uh, randomness of that union, uh, both uh, my families, uh, my dad's family and my mom's family were very welcoming of each other and uh, very inclusive and, and loving. And um, from what I understand, there was no real tension or no real racism that a lot of people from mixed families experience. So I feel very fortunate mm -hmm. in that sense. So they started their lives together at a very young age and it eventually brought them to Ottawa of all places. So my origin story starts in Ottawa, which is you know, also very special for me to, to connect with you all today and to have lived there um, while I was uh, a journalist. So uh, they were there studying at Carleton University and they found out that uh, my mom was pregnant, that I was on the way. So they made the decision that they didn't want to raise their family in the city. They wanted to go back to the reserve. They wanted to raise their children with the knowledge of being the Shinabe and of being on the land. And this was in the late 1970s. I was born in 1979. And that was kind of a radical uh, idea, a radical option to leave post-secondary studies in the city and go back to the res just to raise kids. Uh, but for me, it was the greatest benefit of my life, I think. The fact that I got to grow up in my community, uh, learn about my culture, learn about my history, and really understand my place as an Indigenous person on this land. Um, I give full credit to my parents for making that move and for undertaking that initiative. On top of that, uh, they decided to give me a Nishnabe name when I was finally born in the spring of 1979. And that was very radical. That was very unusual at the time because, you know, for decades, and I can speak only for my community of Wasoxing, 
uh, people were enduring tragedy after tragedy. Uh, there were a couple of very dark uh, decades in our community as a result of being colonized and as a result of being displaced and all the brutal measures that came from the federal government to erase uh, indigenous identity and to take culture away from people and to literally uh, physically remove children from the community. That has some very uh, harmful and negative repercussions in our community. But at the time, um, my parents decided that they wanted to raise their kids uh, firmly attached to their culture and their language from birth. And they approached my grandmother uh, and asked her if she could help them find a name for me in the Ojibwe language in Anishinaabemowin. And she was happy to oblige. She suggested uh, the name of my great grandfather, my grandmother's father, uh, Wabagijik. And in one way, it was to pay homage to him as my ancestor, but in another way, it was to uh, just provide a, an everyday connection and an outward facing, um, I guess, initiative to tell everybody that I came in contact with and to show them that Indigenous culture and Indigenous language still existed, still thrived, despite the measures of, of Canada, essentially, right? So Wabagijik roughly translates into white sky. Uh, but it also refers to the color of the sky when the sun comes up. So, you know, the color of the day as it begins. And, and I feel um, very fortunate and very honored uh, to carry that name going forward. So as I was growing up, my community of Wasoxing in the 1980s uh, was undergoing some pretty radical change. And again, as I mentioned, this was a response to uh, the decades of hurt and harm uh, that people had endured. A bunch of people got together, uh, including my parents and their generation, and decided that it was time to heal. So what they did was find ways to return to the culture, find ways to ensure that my generation and the generations that followed grew up in a happy, healthy, and proud community. So they found ways to bring things like a powwow back, um, to bring ceremonies like the sweat lodge back. And my earliest memories are growing up, uh, sitting at the drum, uh, learning the powwow songs and getting my own powwow regalia and dancing in the circle around the drum. And that was really a triumph for our community to proudly do these things again, because they were illegal under the Indian Act. There used to be an Indian agent in our community who would find people for doing cultural events like that. So, uh, you know, for me, it was a very positive upbringing and I benefited from the positive byproducts of that uh, effort to have this communal healing, right? And one funny story, and I always, uh, you know, go back to this when I think about the sort of DIY or punk rock ethic that many of my community embodied to return to culture. When we started singing at the drum again, um, we didn't have a drum, a big powwow drum in our community. And many of you who've been to powwows before, you know, likely have seen the big, we call it the grandfather drum in our culture. Some other cultures call it something different, but it's the big drum that people sit around and, and, uh, and beat and, and sing songs, right? So we didn't have one of those in our community when my dad and his buddies decided that they wanted to be powwow singers again. So um, they looked far and wide, but, as far as they knew, the drums that were in our community were either destroyed or taken away by the Indian agents or hidden somewhere uh, never to be found again. So what they did was they sort of uh, MacGyvered a drum kit together and they went down to a, a pawn shop in Aurelia and uh, they found an old rock drum kit, you know, like with the bass drum, a snare, a toms and cymbals and so on. So they looked at the bass drum and they talked to the pawn shop owner and they said, uh, we just want that. We just want the bass drum. So the guy was like, yeah, okay, I guess, I guess I'll sell you that for whatever. So they so they, he sold them the bass drum. They took it back to the community and they're like, okay, I guess we need uh, drumsticks too. Um, so they didn't know how to go out into the bush and take the right sticks mm -hmm. yet. So what they did was they took things like tent poles and, and fishing rods and sort of cut them up and then taped foam around the end. And that was their drumstick. So my earliest memories of sitting on the drum are at this big rock bass drum with like a tent pole uh, drumstick singing these songs that I still know today and that I still share with, uh, with my kids. So that was a very radical moment. And it was a sort of 
it, it was difficult, I think, for them to find ways through official outlets to get support to do that kind of thing, um, because there was no such thing as these widespread reconciliation discussions happening now, like, like happening like there are now back then, right? And another big part of that was the reconnection with the land that really um, followed. And uh, part of that was a strong sense of activism and a spirit of reclaiming the land and getting back to it and really fighting for it. When I was about seven years old, um, our community, just to give you some brief context, is an island uh, just across from Perry Sound on Georgian Bay. And there was, used to be a town uh, called Depot Harbor in the northwest corner of the island, uh, but it burned down and it became a ghost town. Uh, still, there was a CN line that went in and out to take supplies to this town, right? And that was our main link to the mainland for a long time was this train, train bridge. Uh, but that was decommissioned uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, still, though, CN kept sending trucks into the community to take sand from one of the quarries. And they did that for a long time. Um, you know, undisturbed. And our community leaders got really fed up with that. And they decided that they weren't going to let, you know, CN steal our resources anymore. So I was seven years old. And I remember my parents uh, putting me and my brother in the car and taking us to the sandpit. And it was a really tense drive, you know, they weren't really saying that much. But we got there and basically everybody else in our community was there. And they were marching around these big dump trucks and these big bulldozers uh, carrying signs and, you know, restricting them from taking any more sand. And it was by and large a peaceful protest. Um, it went on for a whole afternoon. It was in the middle of the summer. Uh, and eventually these trucks and bulldozers all left. And after that, um, it was a triumph. Obviously, it was a victory. But after that, you know, we sort of understood our connection with the land and how important it was to fight for it. And we started, I guess, intensifying some of those ceremonies that we had just reconnected with. And it was very empowering. And it was a result of, of activism, of protest, of radically pushing out these oppressive forces who were stealing from us. And really uh, flipping the script on um, the displacement that we had endured for generations, right? And when I became older and really passionate about writing, I uh, reflected on that in some of my earliest writings. And I wrote a short story about that particular moment when we protested at the sandpit in our community. And I called that short story Dust. And it was the opening story in my first collection of fiction, which is called Midnight Sweat Lodge. It was published in 2012. And I also wrote a, a sort of personal essay, a nonfiction version of that, that was published in Spirit Magazine um, back in the early 2000s, too. So this reconnection with the land and this activism and that was all rooted in radical ideas and radical movements is what inspired me to be a writer. And I've sort of taken it upon myself since to embody being radical uh, in all of my writing, because it is a way to not just raise awareness of the real histories of this land, but also connect with other indigenous people and hopefully empower them and show them that we can speak our truths in these ways and really make effective change. And we're seeing that happen on an almost daily basis, especially on social media. This all leads up to my recent book called Moon of the Crested Snow, which is essentially an end of the world story from the perspective of a Northern Ontario First Nation. There's a widespread blackout uh, that effectively uh, ends civilization. And this community in the North um, experiences it at a much different pace um, to a different degree, yet at the same time still descends into chaos and has to find ways to adapt to this new world while dealing with strange visitors who come in from the South. So the whole thing very much is an allegory for colonialism. Um, strangely, in this book, uh, this remote First Nation becomes desirable. It becomes a refuge for people from the cities. And in some ways, I think that's, you know, a radical approach to telling a story, especially a dystopian or post-apocalyptic one. But the reason I wanted to write a story like that was I hadn't really read anything uh, from an Indigenous perspective in the post-apocalyptic or dystopian genre up until that point of my life. And they always say, um, you know, if there's a book you want to read, write it. 
if you don't find the book out there that you're interested in, just write it on your own. So fortunately, the book has come into, I guess, a modern canon of post-apocalyptic uh, novels from Indigenous authors. And there are many, many other great books out there by Indigenous authors, uh, like The Marathies by Sri Dimaline and um, Future Home of the Living God by Louise Erdrich. So the main themes of the book, I think, are re-examining colonialism, understanding its ongoing impacts, how it uh, c consists today, it persists today, uh, but mostly to um, reconnect with the land and, you know, also consider the perspective of Indigenous people in enduring an end of the world, right? Because we're all collectively going through uh, radical change right now. Our world has ended. You know, we are not going back to the world we enjoyed in January and February of 2020. When we reemerge from this pandemic, things are going to be a lot different. Um, so that's a really hard realization for a lot of people, especially people who come from privileged backgrounds, right? Who haven't had to endure a world ending event. Yet Indigenous nations everywhere already know what it's like to have their worlds end. And part of the inspiration behind Moon of the Crested Snow was a discussion I had with my grandmother back when she was alive about her ancestors being displaced from, you know, the main mainland shoreline of Georgian Bay and effectively what Perry Sound is now. That's where our people uh, traversed since time immemorial to follow food and create shelter, basically depending on the season, right? But after the town of Perry Sound was settled there back in 1857, um, what eventually became the Canadian authorities um, interpreted the Robinson-Huron Treaty to say that the Anishinaabek who lived there couldn't live there anymore. And they had to go out to this island that was essentially an unarable place. You know, they had to essentially try to survive there. So that was the end of the world for my ancestors, my direct ancestors. And my, grandma, my grandmother used to tell me about talking to her grandparents about how they had to do that and logging became the primary industry in Perry Sound, right? So they would look to the mainland and see all the trees being cut down. You know, the trees they lived amongst since time immemorial. And it was an apocalyptic event. And then shortly after, alcohol was introduced into the community. Um, the authorities came and started stealing the children away. This Indian agent came in and imposed his order upon the people making culture illegal. So we have that perspective. You know, we've grown up with knowing that our world ended. And I think for me, it was important to highlight that and to reflect that in literature, um, to open people's eyes to what the realities of this country are. So I feel very fortunate that I've had uh, the opportunities to do that through literature. I feel very fortunate that I am able to share with you all today some of my story and uh, how I became an author and how my upbringing uh, and how my Anishinaabe identity really informs and influences the decisions I make uh, in how I write and what I share with people. And I always pay homage to some of those radical initiatives that uh, I benefited from that made me who I am today. So uh, I will open it up to questions shortly, but what I want to leave you with is just everything in mind that I shared with you and you know, what you, I guess, receive and what you learn uh, nowadays through various reconciliation efforts about you know, engaging and learning about indigenous uh, culture. Um, I would really urge you to try to rethink what you know about Canadian history. Um, think about how you've been taught that Canada started and where that starting point is. And maybe try to expand your horizons a little bit because Canada obviously didn't start in 1867. Um, life on this land didn't start with the arrival of British and French settlers. Um, life here predates that by thousands and thousands of years time immemorial, as, as we say. So consider the land you inhabit. And this goes beyond like the land acknowledgements we see happen today that have become quite ubiqu ubiquitous. Those are great in just sort of establishing a starting point and considering where you are on this land. But I think they are really um, becoming maybe just uh, showpieces, right? And to make a serious effort to you know, connect with Indigenous culture and Indigenous communities, I think you have to think about um, the actions and activities you can take to create good relationships with Indigenous people in your own community, right? So that's what I would leave you with. Um, just make sure that um, you, know, you, know, you carry yourself forward in a positive and loving way and a respectful way. 
And um, I would just say to you all, thank you for uh, allowing me into your homes this morning. And big thanks again to the Creative Mornings Ottawa team for inviting me. And um, I will uh, gladly accept your questions now. Okay, we've got one here. Rob, can you provide some examples as to how we can go beyond the land acknowledgement? Great question. Yeah, that is a great question. I should say right now, things are obviously a little um, upended because of the pandemic. You know, there aren't as many opportunities to meet people face to face and to, I guess, participate in cultural gatherings or events. But that's what I would look to. Uh, you know, the in Ottawa, specifically, the Odawa Native Friendship Centre often has events, you know, community socials. Um, you know, throughout the summertime, there are many different kinds of Indigenous gatherings um, in any community that you live in. So I, I would, you know, make an effort to try to do that, just to get out into, into the community and physically be in a space where culture is being shared and where there are people around sharing culture and creating relationships with each other, right? And, you know, that can probably feel a little daunting, especially if, you know, that's a community that you're um, not familiar with or haven't really had any exposure to throughout your life, right? But the whole idea behind these community gatherings is a celebration of culture and a fostering of good community. And I think you'll find people there who really want to connect with you and want to proudly express their culture and themselves to you as well. So, you know, there, and when you go to these things, there are various ice breaking sort of um, efforts, right? Like there are dances for people to bring people into the circle and so on. So I would look for those uh, community events um, and, and just, you know, expanding your mind a little bit. Uh, you know, reading a book is obviously a great way to learn more about culture and history, um, watching documentaries, um, enjoying the art that is created by Indigenous uh, creatives, and um, just finding ways to further expand your knowledge base. Um, and yeah, there are different sorts of interactive ways you can do that as well. I think you just hit on the next question, so thank you for that. I don't see any hand raised here, but I have a question for you. Um, yeah. As an author and like obviously creative person, um, I wonder how, how do you fuel your creativity? Like, is there anything that you tend to do in your own writing um, routine or process that's sort of when you hit a writer's block? I can't, that's such a cliche term, but <laughs> just curious. That's a great question. And that's not a cliche term at all. Uh, every writer I know experiences that, <laughs> you know, I was experiencing it earlier this week. Um, for me, uh, it, it's what I mentioned just, uh, just a moment ago is trying to absorb as much art as I can. Um, so first and foremost, though, if, if you're trying to be creative and you do hit that block or you hit that wall, uh, step away, you know, and don't feel guilty about that. You know, close the computer, get up from your desk, uh, take a walk around your house or take a walk outside or even just, you know, put your favorite song on your headphones or uh, watch something on TV or give somebody a call, you know, do something for a few moments to take your mind off your project and, you know, just sort of clearing the slate in some ways in a temporary way, I think really helps. And I think it really, in some ways, um, inspires and invigorates you to get back to it, right? Just taking that time away to, you know, sort of refresh your mind and, and just hit the reset button temporarily, right? Um, for me, I, physical activity is a big part of that. You know, that's obviously not possible for everybody, but I'll go out for a walk or I'll go for a run. Um, I'm a jujitsu practitioner, so if I have time, I'll go I do some training with uh, my, my friends on the jujitsu mats. Um, so yeah, just making sure that you make that time for stepping away, but also making sure that you don't overwhelm yourself, right? Don't put too much pressure on yourself and try not to stress yourself out because um, things will come when, they, when they're supposed to. And of course, a deadline will force things, but deadlines can also further fuel that creativity too. But just, uh, yeah, taking that time away to make sure that you're allowing um, just, just a, a reset in, in your head. Yeah, I love that. And somebody here in the chat said, uh, creativity occurs, occurs somewhere in, in the to and fro movement between focus and distraction. I think that's really well said. That's an excellent way to put it. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, question. How do you personally navigate being radical and being a strong Indigenous voice while being of mixed race? I am asking as a Métis person, Algonquin, Algonquin Anishinaabe and French colonist. 
Oh, that is a great question. Um, well, for me, you know, I was fortunately encouraged by my mother and her entire family to be radical and to be as active in politics as possible and to strongly express myself as an Anishinaabe person. At the same time, I always try really hard to make a point of acknowledging and honoring my settler background um, because, you know, I had such strong encouragement from basically one half of myself, right, to you know, proudly be Anishinaabe. So um, I would just say, you know, I, I try to maintain that balance. I try to represent uh, as best as possible. Um, and I think for me, you know, even though I'm half white, no one's ever going to look at me like a white guy, right? So um, I, I do consider that I have white privilege in some ways, though, and that I have that upbringing. Um, but I could never navigate this world as a white person because nobody would ever look at me that way. So I guess because I'm so outward facing as an Anishinaabe, that's what I have to represent um, in a good way as much as possible. So it, it's a dilemma and we could talk for hours about that, those of us who are of mixed backgrounds, but I appreciate the question. And I think just thinking about that, thinking about our place and our background is an important starting point just to ensure that, you know, we represent in a, in a good and I guess harmonious way. Thank you. Um, I have another question here. How does the radical spirit that you have within your DNA continue to fuel you today? I think it, it fuels me much more today uh, now that I'm a father. Um, our older son is about to turn four and our younger son is about five months old. And I think I really recognize and understand the importance of raising the next generation um, in a strong and radical way. And, you know, I just, you know, you become very introspective once you become a parent and you start, you know, thinking about the efforts of your own parents and what they did. And, um, you know, I just have so much love and so much respect for my own parents when I consider um, their actions and, and what they did to ensure their kids grew up to be, you know, as strong as possible, as, as self-aware as possible and so on. Um, so, I, and I think now, you know, I worked as a journalist for a long time and because of that, I wasn't necessarily allowed to be as vocal or as expressive of opinions as I am now. So I, I take that responsibility um, not lightly at all. Like now I'm able to sort of advocate for certain communities and advocate for certain causes. And um, I want to do it as responsibly, uh, but also as effectively as possible. So I think for me, like I'm entering a new phase in my life where um, I'm more suited to do that kind of thing. And it's actually pretty exciting. That is really a beautiful perspective being a father. That's something really shifts uh, when you start to consider lives, you know, the future lives beyond your own. I mm -hmm. think that's, I'm sure a lot of parents on this call can relate to that. Um, another question here in the chat. I have a question about cities and indigenous spaces. What can cities do better in reminding people that they live on indigenous lands? That's an excellent question. And I think that's where land, acknowledgement, land acknowledgements are maybe becoming a little mundane or obsolete. Like, sure, the mayor can get up at a press conference and say that, you know, this city is on uh, the land of these people. Um, but that is repeated so often that it's really starting to lose meaning for, you know, wider communities. And I think a lot of people's eyes glaze over once they start hearing th those things. So I think what cities need to do is really start supporting and funding more resources to strengthen culture and community of the Indigenous peoples whose traditional territories the city has been built upon, right? Um, and that goes beyond just paying the lip service that a land acknowledgement may be. So there are things like uh, funding language programs, um, maybe putting more money into the local friendship center to allow them to do more cultural initiatives and that kind of thing, and um, creating more space for cultural events. Maybe taking surplus city land or decommissioned city buildings and donating them to nearby First Nations or local Indigenous organizations to make sure that there is positive safe space for Indigenous people in the community uh, to be themselves and to proudly express and fortify their cultures and so on. So um, I think cities start, need to start making more tangible actions like that in, in terms of creating stronger and, and I guess uh, more positive and inclusive Indigenous spaces. 
That's wonderfully said. Yeah, we have a beautiful community center, uh, Wabano, that I know you're very familiar with uh, mm -hmm. here in Ottawa. So mm -hmm. if people are looking to sort of, you know, do some charitable donations this year or around this time of year, Wabano is a great option. Um, can you think of any other centers or community groups that people could be supporting right now, Wab? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, and Wabano, uh, yeah, I totally agree with you, Maxine. That's a wonderful place, a uh, great community hub. Um, I would say the, the Odawa Native Friendship Center, um, uh, Minwashin Lodge in Ottawa. They're a, a woman and family shelter. Um, off the top of my head, I, I can't think of too, too many others, but, um, you know, a big part of it is, is showing up for the community when, you know, whenever there's a call out for people to come and support. Um, whatever action that potentially may be. Uh, but yeah, just, you know, and, and I think it, if you connect with places like Wabano and Odawa and Minwash and Lodge, and you ask what else you can do, they may point you in the direction of where else you could donate or where else you could go and volunteer. Wonderful. Our, our audience is so educated. They're sharing all these resources. Oh, yeah. Awesome. I can see that in the chat. That's yeah, cool. cool. Very cool. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think so there's another question here from Nadine to further the question beforehand. How do you find the courage to find a publisher knowing there will be Oh, I think I missed that first one. Sorry. How do you push past any anxieties or fears when you first started writing to get where you are today. Well, that is a great question because, yeah, there was a lot of fear. I think mostly um, what I had to overcome was just my lack of awareness of the industry and of actually writing and really, uh, I think, build up the confidence to put my work out there. Um, there's this term that goes around a lot, uh, imposter syndrome. You know, people, uh, I guess, uh, come they have the internal belief that they are imposters and they don't have the right to do something or they may not be as qualified as they should be to do something like writing a book. But I think that um, there is no clear path to being a writer and there is no one way. Like, and if you were in high school or university and you asked, you know, one of your profs or teachers how you would become a published author, I don't think anybody would be able to give you a clear answer because, you know, there isn't one specific program you do, there isn't one specific uh, school you go to or city you inhabit to, you know, becoming an author. There are a lot of different ways. So I think the, the biggest step is really uh, building up that self-confidence and knowing that you have a story to tell and knowing that your writing is, is strong and essential and that people need to hear your voice and that they need to read the truths that you write um, and then from there um, what I would suggest and, and there's a whole lot I could talk about here but um, you know research all of the publishers in Canada um, there are dozens and dozens of different publishing houses in Canada um, look up their websites and see what kind of books they publish uh, see what their mandate is um, see what their protocols are in terms of accepting submissions and and reading uh, manuscripts and then uh, publishing them from there and, and then you'll get a better idea of um, who you should potentially publish with or how you can potentially pitch them. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a long journey, but I think that's the start. You know, it's just writing your story, uh, being proud and confident of it, and then doing some research to figure out where exactly is a good place for it. Wonderful, thank you. A lot of uh, writers, I believe, on this call too. So this is great stuff for them. Um, let's see, I think, oh, one, so two final questions. Uh, this one's from Gabrielle. What would you suggest as the first step to people who want to start a job working closely with Indigenous communities around them and helping those communities but are not considered coming from those communities directly? Hmm, that is a great question. And um, I mean, that is not a perspective I necessarily have because I'm Indigenous, um, so, so I don't quite know how to approach it as an outsider, but I could, I guess, offer, you know, my insights as somebody within a community, and I think, you know, and I speak only for myself, you know, I appreciate when somebody comes in um, with respect for the culture and for the community itself. Um, who doesn't want to take up space, who basically wants to be there to help uh, and doesn't do it for any sort of glory or any sort of accolades. You know, um, a lot of Indigenous cultures believe in the importance of humility, of, of sort of stepping back, of, of being, 
you know, humble and, and letting the people who need to lead, lead, right? And I think those are good ideals to keep in mind when you're approaching this kind of work. Um, so that is, you know, about, you know, presenting yourself in a humble and respectful way and, and really having a, a clear idea of what you bring to the work or what you bring to the community and, and, you know, having that open discussion with the people you want to work with about what you're going to do and how you're all going to work together to achieve some kind of goal. Right. So um, that's the advice I'd have. Like, I don't know. Uh, exactly what kind of work uh, the question refers to, but um, it's just keeping those ideals in mind and, and keeping an open mind when you approach this kind of work. Yeah, thank you. That's wonderful. Um, that's an interesting question. I, I think probably something that a lot of people consider um, when they when they do think about how they want to have an impact uh, across Canada and across the world when it comes to Indigenous uh, it, like relationships. And um, somebody here just says, listen, 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 listen. Mm -hmm. and, and I love what you're saying too about like leading humbly, uh, leading with good intention, you know, not to get that medal for doing the right thing or whatever it might be. So um, do it from the heart for the right reasons. And I do believe that people will see that if you're true uh, in your intention. So thank you for sharing this. And thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge. I really just beautifully said, um, feeling very inspired. Personally, uh, I loved your book, Moon of the Crusted Snow. Thank I'm you. a big outdoors person when I'm not strapped to this <laughs> computer screen desk. Uh, I love to be outdoors and uh, I love, I, I've learned foraging from my father. So it's been something I've been doing since I was really little. And so, you know, taking and, and appreciating working with the land is something that I've always sort of meant a lot to me, quite frankly. So reading your book was like, just very eye-opening and I think really interesting too in relationship to uh, a COVID pandemic right now, like you said, you know, indigenous communities have had their own lives, you know, turned upside down and they've gone through really a lot of trials and tribulations. So this pandemic is almost like, you know, not a big, not a big shift for all of you and, and us as settlers community, like we need to understand that too and, and learn from, from your guidance and the way that you've, you've move forward past these really trying times to, you know, just do so beautifully and to still stay so close to your culture. So uh, Miigwech, thank you so much for being here today. Well, I'm going to end with one selfish question. Feel free. Can you give us a little insight as to perhaps a sequel of Moon of the Crusted Snow? <laughs> oh, I'd, I'd be happy to. And thank you very much for your kind words, Maxine. And thank you very much again for inviting me. This has been a really cool uh, experience. And it's just really nice to connect with everybody in this way. So keep up the great work to the whole Creative Mornings Ottawa team. You, you're doing excellent work. Um, be proud of yourselves. You know, you're bringing people together and getting them to expand their minds. And, and I think at a time when we really need to reconsider our places in this world, I think this is a positive step forward for a lot of people. So I just want to say uh, kudos to you all. Big shout out to you and your whole team. Um, for the sequel, yes, I am just getting underway. Uh, I'm sort of in the R&D phase right now, the research and development, and uh, I'll start writing in January. So the story basically is going to pick up about a decade in the future, a decade after the end of Moon of the Crested Snow. And the community uh, will send a team of about five or six people down south to see what's left of the world, but also to try to find a way to get back to their original homelands down on Georgian Bay. So it's kind of like a quest story after the end of the world. And um, they're just going to go see what's left, you know, because it's their first exposure to, um, I guess, the post-apocalypse in some ways. So um, I'm having fun with it so far. You know, check in with me again in like three months when I'm actually typing it out. I may not be having as much fun. But uh, that's the way it goes, right? <laughs> awesome. That sounds really good. I can't wait. But no pressure. Take no your pressure. time. <laughs> <laughs> Again, thank you so much. Miigwech, Wob. We loved having you today. It meant a lot to us. Bye.